the book of Genesis and chapter 17. Genesis and chapter 17. I want us to take the opportunity tonight to read the entire chapter together. And so if you found your place, would you please stand together with me? If you'll follow along silently, I'll read aloud Genesis chapter 17. Beginning at verse 1, the Word of God says, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget And I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, his son, 
and all the men of his house, born in the house and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. I want to share with you tonight what we might call a covenant update. That's what we have God giving to Abraham here. An updated version of the covenant. Think of how you often get a notification on your phone and you are being made aware that there's been an update in the technology. There's been an update in your phone's capabilities and you, uh, of course, have that uploaded and becomes a part of your phone. It's an update. Now what we have here in the scriptures is God gives a covenant update to Abraham. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Let's pray together. Father, I do thank you for this evening. Thank you for all that we've already experienced in this service, to hear the choir sing and Rebecca sing and to lift our voices together as a congregation. And now, Lord, we come to the most important part of the service, Lord, where we worship you by yielding ourselves and surrendering to the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts, Lord, to submit ourselves to the supreme authority of your word. And God, I pray that you would teach us the scriptures tonight And in so doing, we would come to know our God better, that we would love you more, give us understanding today, and help us, Lord, to apply the truth of your word to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. On November 20th, 1985, a young but ambitious technology company named Microsoft shipped the first version of its new operating system called Windows. The first version was identified by a number. It was called Windows 1.0. In 1987, Microsoft released an updated version. That was called Windows 2.0. In 1990, they released two updates, 3.0 and 3.1. Since then, Windows has gone through no less, I believe, than nine different upgrades. I believe the latest version is Windows 10. Is that right? Windows 10. And today, think about this, since 1985, today, almost 90% of the home computers in America run some form of the Windows operating system. Back in Genesis chapter 15, just two chapters prior to this, verse 18, it says, In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. That covenant was given to confirm to him the promises that God had previously made. We call it the Abrahamic covenant. We read about it in Genesis 15. What we read there, we could call perhaps covenant 1.0. Then Genesis 16 that I preached from last week, you'll recall that records the sinful shortcut that Abram and Sarai attempted with their surrogate servant, Hagar. Some 13 years, you know, sometimes uh, we're forgetful as we read the Bible. We, We go from one chapter to the next in a matter of seconds. But after Genesis chapter 16, some 13 years after that, God appeared again to Abraham in Genesis 17 and he expanded upon his original covenant. What we read in Genesis 17 could be looked at as covenant 2.0. Now, this may not seem like the most exciting chapter to you and I as we read it tonight, but I will tell you that Genesis chapter 17 is a very important chapter in the book of Genesis as well in the whole revelation of the Bible. Though we as Christians today are living under what we refer to as the new covenant, the new testament, the new agreement, all of that describes the same thing. Though you and I today are living under the new covenant, one that is mediated by Jesus Christ, I would submit to you that we should still be very interested in this record of the Abrahamic covenant. For this reason... Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29 in your New Testament says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The truth is that this covenant still touches us today. 
while we don't live under the Abrahamic covenant, uh, it still uh, relates in some ways to our life today. And we learn some truths as we study it about our God and how he continues to graciously deal with his people. Don't ever get the idea that the grace of God is just a New Testament idea. God has always dealt with people in grace. We say, Pastor, we, you know, we, we talk about the Old Testament and the Mosaic Law. Yes, I understand that. But as you're going to see tonight, God has always dealt with His people in grace. So I want you to look over these verses with me tonight. And I want us, with the help of God, to consider what we learn here about our Lord and His covenant work in our lives today. The first thing I point out that's true about this old Abrahamic covenant as well as the New Testament covenant uh, that Jesus mediated at Calvary is this. God approaches us on his own terms. That is a fundamental truth that you need to understand if you're ever going to properly relate to God. Because we're living in a world and in a time where people are trying to dictate to God the terms of their relationship with Him. But understand this, it has always been this way and it always will be this way. God approaches us on His terms. And if anyone is to have a relationship with God, it will have to be on His terms. In his book, The God Who Is There, Dr. D.A. Carson writes about the various covenants that we find in the Bible. And he titles that particular chapter in his book that's all about the covenants in the Bible, he titles that chapter, The God Who Writes His Own Agreements. And Dr. Carson goes on to describe in that chapter how it has been the case very often in history that a covenant, an agreement, a treaty, if you will, has been imposed by a greater nation upon a lesser one. Isn't that how covenants, treaties, agreements work between two nations? The, the one that's more powerful of the nations, the one who maybe recently has won the war and brought the other to surrender, they establish the terms of the treaty, the terms of the agreement, the covenant, the terms with which these two nations can go forward and operate with one another in peace. And so he talks about that in his book and he explains that it's, it's sort of a top-down sort of agreement where the terms are always decided by the greater power. And Carson goes on to say in his book, similarly with God, he is the God who writes his own agreements, his own covenants. Now, again, that's something for you to, very important for you to understand if you're going to properly relate with God. God writes his own covenants. God does not meet with man and they both bring their ideas to the table and they kind of, you know, both contribute to the covenant, the agreement that will be made. No, listen to me. God and God alone writes his own agreements. He says, if you want to have a relationship with me, it must be on these terms. And you understand that. That's certainly the case we see here tonight with this expanded covenant before us here in Genesis chapter 17. In fact, in this one chapter, you probably didn't notice it, but nine times in this one chapter, God refers to this agreement with Abraham as my covenant. Not our covenant, not a joint covenant. God said, came to Abraham. Abraham fell on his face, a place of submission, and God began to speak to him. And God laid out the terms of the covenant between God and man. He said, it is my covenant covenant. And so again, we're reminded here that our relationship with God must always be on his terms. Let me tell you something about your God. He doesn't play, let's make a deal. 
I know sometimes we're prone, we get in the jam and we want to say, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. Let me tell you something, God doesn't work that way. No, God said, hey, with God, it's my way or the highway. No, you, you, don't have, you don't get any input. You don't get to decide. You know, God doesn't put it to a vote. God says, you approach me always and only on my terms. He comes to us by grace. And we can respond to him only according to the terms that he has laid out himself in his covenant, his agreement. And so let's take a few moments and consider the terms of this Abrahamic covenant because it's similar, it's a shadow of the covenant that you and I live under mediated by Jesus Christ. And so as we think about these terms that God laid out, let me share two things with you. First of all, we see here that God performs the primary responsibility. And for that we can say amen. For that we can rejoice. When it comes to the holy God of heaven and you and I as sinful man having a relationship that can only happen and that can only become accomplished because God performs the primary responsibility. Chapter 17 opens with this special appearance of God to Abram. And God calls Abram into a covenant. God invites Abram to join in with this agreement with him of which he will be the recipient of many blessings. And so God comes to him. He lays out the terms of his covenant. And here's what he says to Abram. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Listen. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, as we read, we noticed that Abram's response to this visitation and revelation of God is a fitting and appropriate one for anyone who ever found themselves in the presence of a holy God. Verse 3 says this, And Abram fell on his face. He didn't say, well, God, you know, I've been wanting to talk to you about this covenant thing and about this relationship between you and I. I have some ideas that I'd like to put on the table. I'd like to run some things past you and see what you think. No, God invites him into this covenant. And you know what Abram does? He fell on his face. A place of reverence, a place of submission, a place of surrender. It's a position that says, God... You have the upper hand. You're dealing with me from the greater to the lesser. I acknowledge that. And I am just thankful that you would give me this opportunity to have a relationship with you. And so it says in verse 3, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying. And over the next four verses, what you read is God promises as his part of the covenant, that he will make Abram the father of many nations, the ancestors of kings, and the inheritor of the promised land. He also says in verse 7 that this covenant is not only to Abram, but to his seed after him for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So, I say all that to say this, we see here that the responsibility of bringing about these promised results of this covenant rests upon God. Abram had a part as far as obedience was concerned, but the covenant overwhelmingly depends solely upon the gracious work of God. That is why 11 times in this chapter we read the Lord saying, I will, I will, I will. For the real work of this covenant 
was something the Lord himself would do because Abram couldn't do it. And once again, we're reminded here that our relationship with God doesn't depend upon our works. Amen? We must walk before him and we must submit to his authority. But the blessings of the covenant are his to do and his to give. Abram, like you and I, he had nothing with which he could bargain or negotiate with God. And neither do we. Amen? When it came to you and I having an established relationship with God as sinners, listen, we didn't have any bargaining chips. We didn't have anything to bring to the table. We had nothing to offer God that would enrich Him. God is self-sustaining, self-sufficient. We can't add to God. And so, the Bible says we must walk before Him, submit to His authority, but it's God who does all of the work. If anything comes from our relationship with God, it will be because of His work and His grace and His mercy. Now, I hope you're listening. Even as we read of this old covenant, we ought to be reminded of the new covenant under which we live in the, in the way in which we have a relationship with God. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And so as we look at this covenant update in Genesis chapter 17, the, the first very apparent thing that ought to stand out to us is this. God approaches us on His terms. And as we look at those terms of this old covenant, we see not only that God performs the primary responsibility, but also we see that God prescribes the participant's responsibility. Now, technically, a covenant is an agreement between two parties. That's the case with this covenant as well. In verse 2, God describes it as my covenant, listen, between me and thee. And after God has laid out his promises in the covenant, he then goes on and says to Abram in verse 9, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Now here's where the update comes in. Are you listening? This is where it becomes, for lack of a better term, covenant 2.0. Up until now, up until this visitation of God to Abram in Genesis 17, God's promises to Abram up to this point have been unconditional. Nothing specific has been asked by God of Abram apart from simply believing in God. Now, however, a sign of Abram's agreement with God is given in the right of circumcision. The sign itself testified of a truth regarding the relationship between Abram and God, and that is this. Circumcision, without going into detail tonight, is a cutting away of the flesh. And it reminded all who went, underwent that procedure that we are not to depend upon our flesh but we are to depend upon the work of God. Notice what God says about this sign, this matter of circumcision in verse 14. He, he states that whosoever does not submit to this sign, that soul shall be cut off from his people. Here it is. He hath broken my covenant. So in other words... It was only through this symbolic act that someone could enter into the blessings of this covenant with, with, with God. It was only through submitting to this rite of circumcision that Abram and his future descendants 
could enter into this relationship with God. You see, this was God's way. And there was no other way that a man could enter into an agreement with him, enter into a relationship with him. Now today, our covenant with God is not based upon circumcision. Our covenant with God is based on the work of Jesus Christ alone. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11 says it this way. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, look right up here. If a man today wants to enter into the blessings of having a personal relationship with God, he must do so only through the way that God has prescribed. And that is only through the person of Jesus Christ. Folks, I remind you tonight that there are not many ways to God. We don't choose for ourselves the way in which we will approach God and establish having a relationship with Him. When we come to Him, we must come on His terms or we cannot come at all. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 Peter preached Christ saying, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so mark it down and don't ever forget it. God is not like ancient Rome. All roads do not lead to him. We come his way through faith in Christ alone or we do not come at all. God dictates the terms of his covenant, of our relationship. And so that's the first thing I see in this chapter. God approaches us on his own terms. God performs the primary responsibility. God prescribes the participant's responsibility. In the Abraham covenant, it involved the sign of circumcision. Under the new covenant, it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God dictates the terms just one way. Amen? It's not a Baptist way. Now, I'm a Baptist, but it's not a Baptist way. It's the Bible way. And nobody has a right to try to devise their own way to come to God, to dictate the terms. Listen, we are the offenders we are the sinners. We don't dictate how we'll have a relationship with God. He and he alone does. There's a second thing I see in this chapter, and that is this. God addresses us with his own titles. Now, in this chapter, we come to a place in Scripture where God now introduces us to three new names, three new titles God introduces us to in Genesis chapter 17. One for God, one for Abram, and one for Sarai. And I'm so thankful we're at Genesis chapter 17. For the rest of this series, I get to call him Abraham and Sarah. Amen? It's tough, those first 17 chapters, remembering to say Abram and Sarah, at least for my little brain it is. In these three new names, God has some lessons for us. In these new names, we're reminded, first of all, of who our God is, and secondly, of how he controls the lives of those who put their faith and trust in him. And so let's consider these new names that God gives us in this chapter. First of all, in the new name that God uses for himself, we see how he reveals his character. Look again at verse 1. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, Here it is, I am the Almighty God. Now that is the first time God revealed himself by that name or that title in Scripture. He's teaching Abram and all succeeding generations after him something about his character. He says, I am the almighty God. Now that's how you read it in our English Bible. If you were to read this in Hebrew, what you, well, you would read I am in English. I am 
El Shaddai. El Shaddai. And that's the first of some 48 times this particular name of God appears in the Bible. I am the Almighty God. I am El Shaddai. And when God revealed himself by this new name, it's a name, it's a title that speaks of the all-sufficient power of God. And when God revealed himself to Abram in that way, it, it said something to Abram about the character of his God. It's a title that God used to confirm to Abram that he was able to do everything that he would promise in his covenant. Need I remind you that the God who revealed himself to Abram as El Shaddai, the almighty God, is the same very God that you and I have a relationship with today through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our El Shaddai. He is the almighty God. He is the one who has the nature, the character, the power to perform Every promise that he's made unto us under the new covenant, the new testament. He is the omnipotent one who the new testament says is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that you above all that you and I could even think to ask him. And as we live in a covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ, let us not forget his name you know oftentimes we get excited when we're reminded of the fact that God remembers our name I remember some years ago a, a, a Christian song came out it's a great song I, I loved it but you remember the song he knows my name boy and it just you know it, it topped the charts for for weeks and months and every church sang it he knows my name and it's wonderful but let me tell you something don't forget his name more important than him remembering your name is perhaps you remembering his name. He is El Shaddai. He is the almighty God. And as such, he always has the power to keep every promise to us. And so we see how he reveals his character. Then secondly, we see how he renames his children. Look now again at verse 5. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 5, God speaking to Abram says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, Bible scholars believe that the name Abram means exalted father or high father father and really when you think about it I mean this man is 99 years old it's it's sort of funny since for so long he had no children and currently he only has one but his name means exalted father high father and as strange as that name may sound for him it's nothing in comparison to what God changed his name to be Abraham it means the exalted father of many. The exalted father of multitudes. C can you see Abram, you know, meeting a stranger for the first time and they have formal introductions and God tells him his name, says, what's your name? He says, Abraham. Oh, the exalted father of many nations. So how many children do you have? Well, currently just one. But I believe in God for multitudes. And so, look with me at verse 15. Verse 15 says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So, when he comes to him and talks to him about this new covenant, there's a name change that takes place. He says, Abram, the exalted <coughs> high father, you're going to be Abraham for now on the exalted or high father of multitudes, of, of many nations. And your wife, Sarah, don't call her Sarah anymore. The word Sarah means to mock or to be contentious is what most scholars believe. 
They're more certain about her new given name, Sarah. What is, we have any Sarahs in here? What's your name mean? Do you know? Princess. Princess. He said, I'm going to change Sarah's name from being a mocking one, from being a contentious woman. I'm going to change her name to Sarah. Princess. What does a prince do? She gives birth to kings. You boys like that? Maybe you're a king in the making back there. And so what we have here now is God renaming his people, not according to their present condition, but according to what they will be, what will be true of them by God's grace and God's power. Now think about this. We're, we're, we're studying the Abrahamic covenant, but we're thinking about it in light of the new covenant. He changed their name. He gave them a name that did not match what they currently were, but what they would be by His grace and His power. Is that not what God does for us as well under the new, under the new covenant? In the New Testament, we who are sinners by birth are called saints by the new birth. We were originally the children of the devil. But under the new covenant that we've entered in with God, we are called the sons of God. You see, folks, and we ought to rejoice in this tonight. Because, because God sees the believer in Christ, he identifies us not by what we are or were, but, what, what, but, but, but by what we can and will be by his grace. 31 years ago, when my wife married me, she took my last name. Now, according to the law, she is now legally Terry Johnson. Previously, she was Terry Crouch. She got an upgrade, and now she's Terry Johnson. Now, truthfully, nothing in her DNA changed. Genetically, she is still very much a crouch. If you would have known Mimi, her mother, you would know her daughter is a crouch. However, her relationship with me has changed her name forever. And can I tell you in much the same way, when we are joined with Jesus by faith, we receive a brand new identity in the family of God and it is based solely, not upon any of our works, it is based solely upon the grace of God and our relationship with Him. So I see in this chapter, number one, God approaches us on His own terms. If we're going to have a relationship with Him, we come on His terms. I see, secondly, God addresses us with His own titles. He names us not according to what we currently are, but what we can and will be by His grace. And then thirdly and finally, God answers us in His own times. After He renames Sarah, look at what He now says in verse 16. He renames her Sarah. She's a princess now. In verse 16, God says about Sarah, And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her, yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Now, I want you to think about this. When we read that, it has been 23 years now since God originally promised Abram a descendant. It's been more than a decade since back in chapter 15... Abram was doubting and said, Lord God, wilt, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? So 23 years in total, more than 10 years since chapter 15. The answer to God's promise and Abraham's desire was a long time coming. Nevertheless, it was coming. And here's the application for us. We are reminded here that God always and only operates according to His divine schedule. When we trust in Him, 
we must do so remembering that he does things his own way and he does things in his own time. It goes back to what you talked about in Sunday school this morning. Faith involves a patience, a patience of letting God work the way he wills to work and when he works. I want you to consider how God answered Abraham and what it means to you and I today. First notice that when God answers us, it's not according to our plans. Now you control freaks have a real issue with that. You might try to make everybody else in your life work according to your plans, but let me tell you something about our God. He doesn't work according to your plans. He didn't work according to Abram's plan, and he doesn't work according to our plans. We're going to look in a few moments at Abraham's initial response to this answer that came from God, but first I want you to notice the request he makes in verse 18. Here's the 99-year-old man who's been waiting 23-plus years for his descendant. Some 10 years ago, over 10 years ago now, he took matters into his own hand and he fathered Ishmael from Hagar. Now, God is coming to him again. He's again promising him a child. Abram. Back in chapter 15, him and Sarai initiated their own plan. That's how Ishmael came about. And you know what? He's still pushing his own plan. In verse 18, And Abram said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. God has come. He's reiterated the promise. He's changed their names. He said, I'm not just going to give you one son. I'm going to make you the father of multitudes. And Abram's response was, oh God, I just wish that Ishmael might be the one. Oh, that Ishmael might live for thee. Here God is visiting him. He's talking with him about a new son and a new blessing. And Abram can't forget Ishmael and the work that he tried to do for himself. Look at verse 20 and 21. Verse 20 and 21 says, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Abram still trying to convince God to follow his plan. Look, God, I know you said no in the past before, but but Ishmael, oh, that he would live before thee. Oh, that he might be the recipients of your promises. God was gracious to Abraham and to Ishmael, but here's the point. God would not change his will for Abraham's will. That's a lesson that all of us need to learn in our lives. God is an immutable God. He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And listen to me, I don't care how sincere you are, I don't care how much you plead, God does not change His will for your will. God was working here according to his sovereign will, not according to Abram's selfish will. And I don't know, maybe maybe we need to be reminded tonight, are you listening? Maybe some of us here need to be reminded tonight that God doesn't need our advice. Now I know some of you like to freely and frequently give your advice to anyone who is polite enough and kind enough to listen to you, but God doesn't call us to help him run his universe or to set out the strategy for the future. Amen? Right now, I don't know what you're going through in your life, perhaps right now you may be pleading with God to allow something in your life, and he may simply be telling you no. Now, it doesn't mean that we're out of order to ask. 
You know the Bible says, if any be sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, talks about the anointing of the oil, and says, pray for healing. We're never wrong to pray for healing. But you know, it may be your will for your loved one to be healed, but it may not be God's will. And God doesn't change His will for your will. You might be pleading for God to do something in your life. You may be pleading for a blessing or you may be pleading for God to remove a burden. And listen, it just may be that God is saying no. It's not a part of His plan and He's not inclined to change courses just because you or I want something else. And you know what faith does? Faith says, I'm going to trust God that he knows what is best. I'm going to trust and believe that God, I only see now. But God sees the end from the beginning. God sees the whole picture. And I only see, you know, maybe how this situation is touching my life and affecting my life or, or those nearest to me. But God sees the overall effect. What we need to learn to do is trust God. Make our prayer unto Him, yes. Pray earnestly, beseech God. You can be persistent in prayer. The Bible teaches us importunity in prayer. But it doesn't change the fact that if God says no, God means no. I, I don't know who said it. I read it somewhere this week. Someone said, if God answered all of our prayers... He wouldn't be God, we would. I never thought of it that way before. So be reminded here that God doesn't answer us and work in our lives just because we really want it to be a certain way. And Abram was sincere. He said, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, I'm going to be gracious and kind. I'm going to bless Ishmael. But Ishmael's not my plan. Ishmael's not my will. I am going to bless you through Isaac. And so when it comes to how God answers us and how God works in our life, number one, it's not according to our plans. Now God is so good and gracious and kind and, and also, he also he oftentimes delights to give us the desire of our heart. But listen to me. None of us are going to strong arm God. We're not going to force God to work according to our plans. And by the way, His plan is better than ours. We shouldn't want to force our way even if we could. We need to believe in the nature of our God is good and wise and trust Him. It's not according to our plans. And lastly, it's not according to our powers. I love the interaction between God and Abram here. Look at verses 17 through 19 and, and notice this conversation that's going on. Verse 17, then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is 100 years old and shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? Now, he wasn't saying that out loud to God, but he might as well have been, right? He was saying it in his heart, but God heard it clear as day. Verse 18, and Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Verse 19, and God said, Sarah thy wife shall, uh, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So God reiterates the plan the promise, and when he did, Abraham laughed. Now, when Abraham laughed, God did not laugh. But God did do something that's pretty funny. He said, I'm going to give you this son of promise, and when I give, you, give him to you, I want you to name him Isaac. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. Abraham, God, it's like God said to Abraham, I, I know what you're saying in your heart. Go ahead and... Laugh, think you're the funny dude. 
But let me tell you something, I'm God. I'm going to give you a son, and when he's born, I want you to call him Isaac. Call him laughter. It's as if God was saying, I'll give you something to laugh at. You're going to have a kid after you're 90 years old and 100 years old. You think that's funny. Now, the point is this. God didn't need some young, fit, fertile couple to bring about his will. Because he doesn't work according to our power or our plan. In fact, God didn't want to use a young couple. God wanted to prove that the accomplishing of his will is not dependent upon the power of man. Let me tell you something about God's will. It's sovereign. You ought to do God's will in your life. Because you'll receive so many blessings if you do so. But if you won't do God's will, guess what? He'll get someone else to do it. But His will is going to be done. Because it's not according to your plan. God calls you to ministry or God calls you to some work in the local church. And and you run from the will of God for your life. You don't do God's will. God's not up there saying, oh, no, what am I going to do now? My plan is all falling apart. My strategy for the future, he really, you know, he really put a kink in my plan here because he's saying no to me. No, God says, okay, I was just giving you the opportunity. You would have been a part of many blessings for your life, but that's fine if you don't want to do my will. My strategy for the future, my work that I will to be done is still going to be done. I'll just get someone else to do it. And you are always the loser for not doing God's will in your life. And so, Genesis chapter 17, the Abrahamic covenant updated. No, we don't live under that covenant, but it foreshadows the covenant that we live under. And we see lots of similarities and blessings that are blessing to us when we learn them. Amen? All right. Uh, Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'm not going to ask you to come forward tonight, but uh, I would want to ask tonight. Are you surrendered to God's will for your life? Are you that one that likes to always be in control and maybe even finding yourself, maybe you didn't even realize it till tonight, God kind of pointed out to you, but if we're not careful, in our lives, we'll try to dictate to God what he should do, what he needs to do with our children, what he needs to do with our grandchildren, what he needs to do in the life of another brother or sister. Uh, Let me tell you something. I don't mean to burst your bubble, but God just really doesn't need your advice how to run his world. Can, Can I tell you something else by implication? The Holy Spirit is mighty good at doing his work. You might be well intentioned, but you know nobody needs you to be the Holy Spirit in their life. God is completely capable of communicating His will, His way, getting His message across to people. Now, He might use you to do that. But don't presume that you need to step in and take over the role of the Holy Spirit in someone else's life. Pray for them. Love them. But wouldn't it be good if we'd just give God credit for being the Almighty God, the El Shaddai, the one who is completely capable. Listen, you don't have to try to take control of every situation. You don't need to try to stick your nose in business that doesn't belong to you. Hey, those of us who parent adult children, you need to be careful about injecting yourself into your adult children's lives and marriages and child rearing and thinking that you got to, you know, come in there and fix it. We just need to love people, pray for people, and beseech the one who is the Almighty God, the El Shaddai. And then maybe it is tonight that you need to learn some of the lessons that Abraham and Sarah learned about just trusting God. Let me tell you something about our God. He's really good at what he does. He's really good at being God. Brother Matt, I've heard you say that. A lot of times, God's really good at being God. The problem is sometimes we get in his way. 
We just need to let God do his work. Father, I thank you for the word of God tonight. I pray that you'd help us to learn these truths and apply them to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's have some ushers come forward. We're going to receive the offering tonight. And then when we dismiss, I remind you, if the ladies can meet Miss Sherry and I just as quickly as possible in Lippert's Fellowship Hall, I don't want to hold you up and keep you long. I know it's a school night, and, uh, but if you can meet with us quickly, the sooner everybody gets in there, the sooner we can get started, all right? All right, Brother Yoni, would you pray for the offering? Let's all stand together. Don't forget, if you have children in the nursery, if you or your husband can pick them up first before the meeting, because ladies in there need to come as well, all right? Uh, Brother Jonathan, would you come and lead us in song, and we'll be dismissed. Victoria, quit talking in church. No, can I see you right up here for just a second? We're going to sing the chorus of I'm a Child of the King. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm a child of the king his royal blood now flows in my veins and I who was wretched and poor now can see praise God praise God I'm a child of the king have a blessed week